is only a whisper away. They know his motive. His murders of his son. Beyond your wildest nightmares. August 18th, 1973. Reports of a bizarre chainsaw-wielding family began to filter out of central Texas. Then silence. For 20 long years, nothing further was heard. 1995. Prom night isn't turning out the way you expected. You find yourself on the wrong road at the wrong time. About to come face to face with a living nightmare. Welcome to my world. The silence is over. He's dead now. Madness has returned. Family values have gone straight to hell. I want these people to know the meaning of horror. You want scared? Have a look behind you. Long night, boys. I could use a little action. Hi, this is Russell Todd from Chopping Mall. He knows you're alone in Friday the 13th Part 2, and you're listening to The Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome back to The Hysteria Continues. And this time we are headed back to Texas for a yet another Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And this one has been variably known uh, as the, uh, the New Generation or the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And as you might The next guess, generation. And I can't believe Nathan is not the one to tell you this, Justin. Do you know what? I'm getting myself uh, mixed up with that, that suede song, aren't I, Eric? Yes. New, that new generation. suede song. Yeah. Yes. So, which, of course, that would be great if uh, Nathan played out with that. Um, he probably won't. But, so, anyway, the, the variously monikered... Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie from 1995. So this is a Nathan pick, isn't it? And I know, Nathan, you've been champing at the bits to cover this movie. Oh, it's been years in the making. I <laughs> said, unlike this movie. But um, obviously, we're not going to spoil what we think about this. And uh, but uh, how are you doing, Nathan? Anyway, I'm um, doing um, okay. Um, except I'm not feeling well today. So it's one of those days. I'm sorry to hear that. So, well, hopefully this will perk you up. I'm hoping so. And this is probably the reason he's feeling unwell. No. <laughs> no, this is why it's the cure for the unwellness. Okay, well, we'll see. We'll ask you at the end of this uh, episode, if we remember how you're doing, Nathan, and see if the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the next generation, has remarkable, miraculous healing powers or not. That'd be awesome. I have a feeling it won't. But who knows? We'll see. But Eric, how are you doing? I'm doing okay, considering I watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the Next Generation. Well, this could be a divisive show, couldn't it, perhaps? <laughs> um, and Joseph, how about you? I brought my own mic. Did you? Did you buy a new mic? No, I just brought one. Oh, okay. Well, I'm It's a Simpsons reference, by the way. Well, I, they, you know those always go over my head. But, uh, yeah, well, um, in time on tradition, let's have a little chat about what we've been watching recently. So, Eric... Have you caught anything since we last recorded? Yes. I, the only thing I caught, and I know, Nate, I, I know Joseph has watched this as well, is, I have to think of what the title is, Five Nights at Freddy's? Is that what it's called? That's correct. Okay, so yeah, I, as you can tell, I was completely oblivious to this um, video game franchise. I'd never heard of it before. Uh, but it's the new Blumhouse movie that came out a couple of weeks ago, and it's about a rundown... Um, diner slash video arcade from the 80s that has these animatronic animals that used to you know play live for the customers and they have somehow got possessed by the souls of some um, dead children murdered children and they're going on kind of a murderous rampage which all sounds quite good but unfortunately I thought the film was incredibly flat Um. I can't really pinpoint what exactly wrong with the film. I mean, well, for starters, it's 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 very tame. Now, not not that that's an issue because there's plenty of PG thirteen horror that I really enjoy, but this one feels so watered down to the, you know, it it just comes across as being really um, bland. Um, the lead character is this kind of insomniac who has to sort of take sleeping pills all the time, and he spends half the the well, he spends most of the movie in kind of this sort of drugged out state if he's not asleep, um, which makes him kind of an unengaging lead. Uh, this, the horror is 
really minimal, I thought. I mean, it has kind of a mystery element to it, as the, our lead character had uh, his brother was abducted when he was a child, and he's trying to solve that mystery. But that kind of, as that unfolds, it's it's a bit of a damp squib at the end. And I just found the f- film really sort of empty and hollow and really, I suppose, boring is the best word for it um it it's it felt like a film that had a load of production problems because it f- it didn't flow properly at all for me and it felt like there was sort of huge plot holes and lots of it felt like there was tons of rewriting on the fly so yeah not a glowing recommendation for me it's doing mega business at the box office though like obscene business and i think it's on the back of its reputation of as a, a franchise and i see people giving it good reviews and it seems to be playing well with kids um, so because uh, I was chatting to Meep about it, our friend Michael Ferrari, and he was his two kids really enjoyed it. And there's somebody at work took his three kids to see it and they all loved it. So maybe I'm just the wrong generation. You know, I'm almost at half a century now. Uh, so maybe it just wasn't for me um, because I was unfamiliar with the video game. Maybe that affected my enjoyment as well. But uh, yeah, I didn't enjoy Five Nights at Freddy's, I'm afraid. Uh, what did you think of it, Joseph? Um... Visually, I thought the movie was pretty interesting, you know, at least in relation to the the animatronic villains. Um, It's my understanding that all those scenes with the mascots were done practically, and I think they only relied upon CGI just for color correction. You know, I haven't really followed the movie's progress all that much, so I may be incorrect on that. But, yeah, the movie looks amazing, but my compliments pretty much echo yours. Are they in there, rather? I found the rest of it to be, you know, joyless and depressing. I wasn't sure for, you know, who my sympathies should lie. The The human characters are so dour and perpetually depressed. And the animatronic bad guy's motivations are so muddled that any sense of tension or fear is lost. Um, you know, I've only seen bits and pieces of the video game source material. But what I've seen of it, you know, at least had a sense of fun, a cheap fun to it. You know, lots of jump scares and suspense, and there's none of that here. The movie's also, you know, neutered, like you said, from its source material, to the point that anything that should jolt the audience is kind of held back to obtain that, you know, general audience rating. I mean, like you said, it's made an obscene amount of money at the box office, even while it was uh, concurrently streaming on Peacock. So it's obviously doing something right, but, you know, ultimately, I... I wanted something more along the lines of a popcorn slasher film with animatronic robots slaughtering people left, right, and center. And we really don't get that. It's just boring and one note and way too morose for its own good. Mm. And uh, But I will say it was a lot, lot, lot better than the animatronic Santa movie from last Christmas. But I can't remember the title of it. The one with the really sweary... Christmas, lead. bloody Christmas? That must be it, yes. I actually enjoyed that one a little more, despite the foul language. At least it kind of was more horror-based. This one just felt too kiddie-friendly for my liking, so... So there we go. That's all I've seen, Justin. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, Have you seen, incidentally, I mean, the two films that kind of reminds me of, I know uh, the Nicolas Cage, is it Willy's Wonderland? (laughs) <laughs> which, uh, yes. which sounds like uh, Eric's Friday Night uh, <laughs> Entertainment. Rude. But, um, uh, and also the Banana Splits movie from a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, the Banana Splits movie w- is a, a million times better, in my opinion. Right. Okay. I haven't seen Willy's Wonderland, Justin. Pff, it surprises me, but uh, there you go. Um, <laughs> You've Nathan- been to a Wonderland of Willy's, I assume. <laughs> I expect so, yes. Nathan, how about no you? No comment. <laughs> I have not uh, seen Five Nights at Freddy's yet, but I have played the games, so you know I do want to see it. I just haven't had a chance yet. Okay, no problem. Well, thank you, Eric. Is anything else? No, that was it. Okay. Well, what about you, Nathan? Uh, well, I watched one on your recommendation, The Thirteenth Alley. Oh. Uh, which is the bowling slasher. Was it up your alley? Um, it was, uh, it was really good. Um, yeah, I feel like it came out around the same time as gutter balls and I know you guys aren't big fans of gutter balls. I liked it, but I do feel that in gutter balls, some of the characters could come across a little obnoxious. So in some, 
Well, <laughs> in this one, it's a much more tamed down version. I mean, it does have like an obnoxious character, but you know, it's um, it, it's played kind of for laughs. Really, it's it's a pretty harmless movie. Uh, I like that about it. I love the idea of a decapitated head coming out of the uh, bowling ball return. That was fun, and of course, you know, using a head for a uh, bowling ball. I mean, it's not. Um, the first time, because, you know, they did it also in Sorority Babes and the Slimeball Ballerama. Uh, but, um, you know, it's it's always fun to see. And so I loved it for that as well. Um, yeah, I would probably say I liked it more than Gutter Balls. Um, you know, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, but, yeah, the, the ending definitely threw me. Um, but uh, I think uh, overall, I actually kind of liked that they ended it the way they did. It's just so stupid, and I like stupid stuff. No. <laughs> uh, did, Joseph, did you watch it? No, not yet. I do still have that copy. Um, I plan to watch it, but it's not our top priority right now. Okay, and uh, Eric, I take it you've not seen it? I've not seen it, no, but I am intrigued because it's directed by Bob Hopkins. <laughs> I mean, I kind of, uh, it's, the fact that it was directed, it came out the same year as Gutterballs is it, coincidental. There must be something, you know, something in the water. It quite happens quite often, doesn't it? Films that have got a very similar premises come out of the same year for whatever reason, usually from somewhere like The Asylum. But um, I mean, I liked, I mean, it's really, really stupid, but it's kind of, uh, it's done in a way that is, it's, it's kind of a bizarre movie because um, it kind of plays it straight, but everything is so ridiculous. And you've got this killer walking around, in this medieval costume with this massive metal mask um, and a battle hammer. Didn't seem very practical. Um, and there was no reason given for why the killer was wearing that garb. It just, it just, they just happened to be. Um, but I, you know, I love the, you know, all this, it's just all the ridiculous stuff like the, the, the girl with, you know, putting voodoos, you know, using voodoo and stuff and just kind of ridiculous touches all, all the way through. It's like one of the characters will say some harmless comment. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's something about inviting her there. And it's like her first response is, I know voodoo. Yeah, that's all kind of pretty stupid. I mean, say if you're interested in um, my favorite taken out, I've reviewed it on History Live. So, uh, um, but uh, yeah, is there anything else, Nathan? Um, well, I mean, we've already talked about it, but um, uh, Wes wanted to watch The Lost Boys. So I watched that with him uh, for the first time. You know, he'd never seen it. Um, I still like the Lost Boys, um, although um, ever since Joseph brought up the fact that they say Michael's name like constantly, like it's all I could hear. Like, like I just kept hearing his name and I'm like, God, I feel like every sentence his name is in there. But, you know, that's, you know, I'm I'm not trying to be insulting to the movie because, like I said, I do like it. The maggot scene's kind of gross, though. Mm, yeah, mm. I know. Okay. Well, thank you, Nathan. Anything, anything else? Um, I don't remember if I talked about it last time or not, but I watched the conference. Okay. I liked it. I thought it was a fun little slasher movie. Again, I love the killer's getup, but it's completely impractical. Um, you know, I just don't know how you could easily kill people, you know, dressed up some of the ways these killers are dressed. Um, but you know, it's, it's good. It's got a few moments. One, particular moment that i was just you know laughing hysterically at this this woman like kicks in the door and she's got this big like scythe and she's just swinging it and screaming her head off wildly and just the whole scene and build up to that was really funny to me so yeah i liked it cool Uh, yeah i kind of um i I quite liked it i I thought it was i i think the scandinavian humor may have been slightly lost uh, uh, sometimes, but uh, it was a fun slasher. It was fun to kind of throw back. So, uh, but uh, Eric, uh, that's not one you've seen. It's on Netflix. No, no. no. Uh, what about you, Joseph? Have you any interest in that one? Hey, I'll see it eventually, but I haven't seen it. Right. Well, thank you, Nathan. Um, at risk of rhubarb ladying, you've that's I'd take it that is your final offering. Yeah. Apart from the main feature, which we have you to thank for. But uh, Joseph, how about you? Just five nights at Freddy's for me this week. Okay, well, thank you. I've got a few just to kind of rattle through. One of the things I was, I was um, because I've been sort of laid up with a, a, a bad foot um, the last couple of weeks, um, I kind of, I was flicking through Tubi, and for some reason I started watching Amateurville in Space. I think it's Amateurville in Space. 
um, all of about five minutes of it because I, I I just got the curiosity got the better of me to see. I just saw there were like a million amateur horror movies or um, on there, and I knew that most of them were like low budget ones. But um, and then I started watching five minutes of Amityville Karen, and they are kind of <laughs> terrible. Um, I mean, they're like beyond. They're more like home movies than anything. Have, have any of you seen any of these kind of? I mean, no, I see. Quite, I see them hmm. cropping up on on streaming services, and there's a lot of them on Prime and that. Like there's Amityville Scarecrow as well, I think. Um, yeah. But no, I haven't braved watching any of them because I can tell that they're sort of top and safety productions. Yeah, I love I love uh, Tubi to death, but they're not very picky about what they put on their platform. No, well, I started watching. I just thought out of interest because uh, I think I watched the documentary. I said, actually I watched the, an Amityville, um one of their original Tubi originals about the Amityville haunting or the Amityville crime or whatever you want to call it, and then that kind of popped up as a suggestion afterwards. So I thought I'd give it five minutes, but it, it's it was just so beyond poor that I just thought I can't I can't really waste eighty minutes of my life on this. So, but anyway, just a couple of other ones that I've um, looked. I, they kind of the new. I kind of guess it's the, the kind of the, the 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 kind of the most talked about horror movie at the moment. And in certain circles, is the Argentinian movie where evil lurks. Um, have you heard of that, guys? Is that one that's kind of cropped up on your radar? It must not be talked about too much because I've never heard of it. I've never heard of it. <laughs> Well, it's kind of um, it's one that got um, it's one of those films that's been people have said it's a scare one of the scariest movies ever made, um, and it got rave reviews in some of the newspapers. Um, and so I kind of watched it on Shudder because uh, it's a Shudder exclusive, and it uh, you know it's it's an okay. I you know sometimes when you go into film and it's so overhyped and people go scariest movie ever and blah blah blah, and invariably it's not going to be the scariest movie ever. Um, so I kind of liked it. I mean, the, the basic premise is um, this kind of remote Argentinian community where um, there's like a possession starting and this possession can be kind of like a bit like the ring almost kind of or the grudge kind of passed on to other people. Um, and uh, so so it kind of starts spreading through the community and there's two there's people trying to escape it and get away. Uh, and it's got some really shocking moments in it, um, which were kind of really kind of quite envelope pushing in some ways. But it kind of, sort of for me, it kind of descends into kind of quite that kind of, you know, trope of sort of uh, possessed children being a bit spooky thing towards the end. Um, so I didn't think, you know, I, maybe I rewatch it with like now I know what to expect. But um, but yeah, so that was that. Um, a couple of other things to kind of mention uh, sort of quickly. I uh, caught up with Killer Book Club. On Netflix um, from this year, I think it's released in the summer this year. Span- now, how was that? Because I really do want to see that. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It's a Spanish slasher set um, uh, where you've got like a, a book club of students at university are kind of reading a book about a killer clown, and then that prank goes wrong. Somebody dies, and then soon after they start getting stalked and killed off one by one by a killer clown. So, if you've heard that plot before, it's not a huge surprise because essentially the film is kind of modelled almost exclusively on um, 90 slashers from Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and um, Urban Legend. Um, and so it goes beyond really a kind of a, a sort of a tribute to even beyond the pastiche, I kind of guess. It hasn't really got an original bone in its body. Having said that, it's quite fun. Um, you know, there's some splashy 80s-style gore in it. Uh, they kind of um, nods to the 80s with cover versions of things like Pet Shop Boys, It's a Sin, uh so yeah i enjoyed it it's fun but it's kind of one of those films definitely you disengage your brain um and you know hey we're talking about slasher movies we're slasher movie podcasts and not to do them down but that whole repetition thing of is you know it's it's a kind of cookie cutter movie but in a way that kind of makes you hungry for cookie cookies uh so it hits a lot of the familiar strides of like those kind of 90 slashers um from even from <laughs> it the, almost sounded like you said you were hungry for cooties i was like uh, no i don't think mm-hmm. so but <laughs> um so yeah it's worth a watch but it's kind of um real kind of comfort horror really hasn't got a mean bone in its body um but it's uh yeah it's it, it is kind of a love letter to those 90s slasher movies so if you love those then i you probably get some mileage out of it um, and if you don't I mean, you probably have some fun with it anyway so um another couple of quick ones i mentioned was the um uh, on the low budget side of things, but in a completely different angle to the Amateur movies, was um, uh, when the Trashman knocks um, from director Chris Moore, who's done films like 
uh, Children of Sin and Triggered. Uh, and this one is kind of like a love letter to John Carpenter's Halloween, the original one. Um, but I thought it was, you know, really well done considering its budget, which is pretty low, uh, but beautifully shot. Um, we've got some very evocative shots in there, uh, very well acted and also got some kind of the quirkiness and the originality, um, even though it's kind of, it's definitely a homage to Halloween. It's definitely got its own kind of um, style to it, unlike uh, the uh, Killer Book Club. So I think that's by the time this comes out, that'll be streaming on Amazon Prime. So yeah, that's worth checking out. And again, um, both this and Killer Book Club um, are I've, I've reviewed on Hysteria Live. You want to check those out. And the last one I mentioned is uh, Dead Hunt um, from Don Dola, um, who co-directed this uh, in 2007. And friends of the show Robert Long sent uh, sent me a screener of the extended cut, which is going to be hopefully coming out. Uh, to uh, to Blu-ray, I expect, um, at some point soon. Uh, and if you've not seen that, again, it's... Um, uh, I mean, a classic slasher movie set up of like a, or like a... And then there were none uh, sort of types uh, set up of a, a group of horror um, fans uh, go to a, kind of a kind of party, small convention in a warehouse uh, and uh, find themselves locked in and are literally picked off one by one. So, again, a very low-budget movie, but the last movie by kind of low-budget budget or, or tier, Don Dola. Um, and uh, that was a lot of fun. So, you know, if you do get a chance to pick that up when it comes out and it's an extended cut, then that's definitely worth uh, doing so. So I know, Joseph, you've seen Dead Hunt at least, haven't you? Yeah, Nathan saw it as well. We saw it in Baltimore with Robert Long and uh, David Molay, uh, BTK, um, that's the last time I saw it. Uh, I think I reviewed it for your site. You did. And um, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty decent low budget movie actually. Um, I mean, it doesn't do anything new. Obviously it's a slasher film. What slasher film really does these days, but for the budget, they did a really good job. I thought it was pretty atmospheric. The characters were likable. Um, I, I like the idea of a bunch of forum members getting together because I've run a forum for like 25 years. So it kind of speaks to me in that level. Um, it's, I do look forward to seeing it again. I haven't seen it since 2010 or 2011, whenever we saw it with Robert. So um, yeah, check it out. Cool. Excellent. And just before we get to the, the main part of the show, I'm just going to shout out to a new listener called Paige, which is... Um, Stuart's uh, nephew's girlfriend who uh, bought my book and is a horror fan and started listening to the podcast. So if you're still listening out there, Paige, uh, just wanted to say hi and thank you for listening. So, so um, But we are moving on to the main attraction and I'll get this right. What do you prefer? Do you prefer it, the, the return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre or Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the next generation, Nathan? Um, I actually love both titles, so yeah. I think the next generation is the more kind of common title. Yeah. Well, well, that's what we're going to be covering after. What do we have, Joseph? We have a uh, an HBO um, intro for the movie, actually. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, after this, uh, Nathan will bring us back in. Twenty years ago, five teenagers made a wrong turn and ended up dead. Well, they got off easy. <laughs> Leatherface is back. This time, he brought the family. Are you having fun? Oh, God. Matthew McConaughey. You gotta watch me in the car for strangers these days. Renee Zellweger. If you're gonna kill me, then do it. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the next generation. When a helpful family invites two lost couples in for a good old down-home massacre, the prom night teens find themselves all dressed up with nowhere to escape. Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey star in this hilarious, bone-chilling sequel to the horror classic. And with Leatherface, if looks could kill, he wouldn't need a chainsaw, which is a good tagline, by the way. Um, So Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation, when... um, it came out when I was a teenager and desperate for any horror movie that I could find because I think it was during the horror movie drought um, before Scream came along. Um, so uh, when this one came out, you know, I uh, watched it. I originally didn't know how I felt about it because um, it was so different. It wasn't exactly 
what I was expecting after seeing, you know, the other Texas Chainsaw movies. Um, it completely goes off the rails. It goes way out there in in left field, uh, especially by the time, spoiler alert, we get to the end and the guy in the limousine shows up. Um, it's just it's so ridiculous the whole time. Um, I love the character of Darla, who is, uh, you know, like you know, kind of the female member of the family uh, in this one. And, um, you know, Matthew McConaughey goes all out as his performance as Vilmer uh, with his remote control leg, uh, which I thought was a really fun um you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, character trait to have for him. Um, I love the old couple at the end, Mr. And Mrs. Spottish, you know, first they weren't even going to pick up Jenny and then they finally do. And then she's just like, there's a monster chasing her with a chainsaw. Step on it, Mr. Spottish. And, um, I just, (laughs) the dialogue is just so over the top ridiculous at times, uh, which, you know, obviously is something that I, you know, very much love. Um, I find um, that, you know, it's definitely to me leans more towards satirical comedy than, you know, uh, it's I, I wouldn't call it bone chilling uh, by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, there's even one scene where Leatherface stands up and Renee Zellweger tells him to sit down and shut up. And he does, which I just I thought was hysterically funny because it's it's just ludicrous. Um, but yeah, overall, I'm a huge fan, huge fan. Uh, but I mainly wanted to pick this because I know that there's a chance I'll be alone here. So I decided I wanted to hear your guys thoughts. So I'm going to go in order of how I see you guys on Skype. So Eric. Okay. Well, this is a much, uh, trashier production, uh, than the previous ones, uh, but it, it manages to hit all the same beats as Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And as the resident person on the podcast who doesn't really like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise, I think I'm the only person in the world who doesn't really rate the first film as a masterpiece. I think it's a, the first half is fairly good. The second half, I don't like at all. Um, but this one, I thought, you know, going into it, I remember watching for the first time thinking this this could be the one that sort of grabs me now because it's about teens on their prom night and it's going to be more of a slasher film and I think I'm really going to get into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise now and you know I can tolerate maybe the opening half hour of this film but after that it's just not my cup of tea at all Nathan I'm afraid I mean I like the opening narration. It's 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 delivered in this really sort of Kent Brockman Simpson style, and I loved how the um, when they're getting their prom photos taken at the start, it's accompanied by that sort of familiar flash sound effect from the first film. I thought that was quite clever, uh, and I really like the character of Heather, who's the she's this really extreme uh, valley girl um, stereotype. Um, and she gets all the best dialogue in the film. Unfortunately, like once she leaves the film, uh, my brain leaves the film as well because I just uh, the rest of it, it. It does all the same things that the rest of the films in this franchise do. Is it ties somebody to a chair? It has her screaming. It has the family screaming and arguing with, with each other, and it just becomes shrill and annoying. And um, yeah, I just it becomes unwatchable to me. Um, I do love the 80s and 90s cliche of the Renee Zellweger character, how she's supposed to be the ugly duckling, when really she's this sort of um, playboy model with a pair of horned rim glasses on. Um, you know, just take off the glasses and suddenly she's a princess. Um, Sean's hair. Sean is, I think it's Renee Zellweger's date. Um, uh, he had the exact same haircut as I did in 1992. So if you wanted to see what I looked like 30 odd years ago, then that's it. Although he's, I thought he was a really bad actor in this. And the same with the other uh, male victim, Barry. Um, I think one of his lines is, please, mister, you're scaring me. Um, yeah, so don't give up the day job. Um, so yeah, the, the I mean, the early teen scenes with the teenagers had me thinking this was going to be more of a Friday the 13th film. And unfortunately, it doesn't pan out that way. For me, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series gets better when the crazy family are removed from the 
equation, which is why I really enjoyed the most recent one that uh, came out on Netflix last year or earlier this year, was it? I can't remember. But um, it, it had just Leatherface as a villain. And that's when I can really get on board with this series because I just find crazy family horror movies don't do anything for me. It's just one of those things. We all have this subgenre of horror that just don't, you know, float our boats. And that's the one for me. Uh, it just the you know I can handle a crazy family if they're slightly rooted in reality but when they're all just shouting and screaming at each other and revving chainsaws and they have the victim screaming as well it just becomes too much noise for me um, I thought the character of Darla was quite interesting but I, and I'm not sure if her initial appearance in the film is meant to make her appear to be a possible ally to the good guys because it's kind of obvious if you've watched any of these films that she's uh, a looper. Um, I did like the idea of the bionic leg that uh, Matthew McConaughey's character has as well. Um, but that's, you know, they're the only sort of few refreshing moments in the film for me because, as I said, I thought the final hour of the film was just insanely boring and noisy. And um, I began to almost wish I could be watching Fella Day instead or Club Dread. That's how bad things got in that second half of the film. Although I... in hindsight i think this is a better film than fella day and club dread so um yeah um as i said there's the, the, the best films in this franchise are to come for me personally which is sacrilege i know but as i said i prefer leatherface on his own doing his um jason Voorhees type slashing rather than the crazy family kidnapping somebody and tying them to a chair yet again and having them screaming yet again and having them all arguing yet again. So, yeah, it's a big thumbs down for me, I'm afraid, Nathan. I hated the film. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I mean, I can't say I'm shocked. Um, okay. Uh, Joseph. Well, I can say that the acting in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, The Next Generation, is pretty top-notch uh, for the most part. You know, mainly from Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger. I think they're both kind of fun to watch when they're not screaming at the top of their lungs. But, unfortunately, the constant screaming takes up a majority of the runtime. And by the end of the movie, I just felt like I was tied to a chair and screamed at for an hour and a half. And it just wasn't very pleasant. Um, I mean, there is a weirdness to the film. Uh, this, this insistence on throwing in everything, including the kitchen sink... You know, that is kind of oddly compelling in its own sort of way. I mean, we get a cross-dressing Leatherface who may or may not be struggling with his sexuality. Uh, there's conspiracy theory antics suggesting that the Sawyer clan is kind of sanctioned by a faction of the government. And, of course, a, a group of teens who uh, stumble into all this hokum. Um, you know, none of it should work and none of it does consistently. But in bits and pieces, I found myself strangely fascinated by some of it but you know at the end of the day like eric i kind of want a group of teens being chased by a madman and we don't really get that here except in very very small doses um i'm not sure why at least up until this point in the series that the creative forces behind these films keep up with the notion that paying you know more lip service to the family and not leatherface equals greater en entertainment it doesn't, you know, especially when all they do is yell and scream and curse and dial up the general noise level to 11. Um, Leatherface himself, I mean, he continues to devolve into like a sub footnote character with nothing to do. And, you know, the actions that a title like Texas Chainsaw Massacre would imply, you know, namely a chainsaw massacre, you know, continue to slide down this steep slope into this kind of pool of nonsense I mean, there is no ch there is no chainsaw massacre here, none whatsoever. You know, again, uh, some of it is interesting in and of itself; those little pieces here and there. But you know, none of it really adds up to much of anything in the grand scheme of things. So you know, sorry, Nathan, I like moments in this film. The teen characters, I thought they had sort of a goofy, blasé attitude going into the main story that kind of promised some good slasher fun to be had. And, you know, again, Matthew McConaughey and Renee, Renee Zellweger, you know, they give it their all when they're asked to go kind of go back and forth in this kind of battle of, uh, I guess, wits and wills. But, you know, at the end of the day, all I could really say to myself was, what the hell did I just watch? And do I even really care? Not really. 
All right. Now, Justin. Okay, Nathan. Well, I'm going to shock you by saying I actually quite liked this movie. Um, <gasps> so I know. Uh, it was kind of it was interesting because I was watching it and thinking, what, where the what the fuck is going on here? What they what are they going for? And although usually it's a sign that a film is is um, not engaging, I had a quick sort of look at sort of a couple of reviews, and when I kind of realised it was kind of playing as a kind of parody or a satire of those kind of um, uh, sort of late eighties, early nineties films. Uh, then I started to have a bit more fun with it. I must admit, I I preferred. I did enjoy the first um, thirty minutes um, with the kids um, uh, leaving the prom and everything like that. And it, like Eric, I felt, oh, this is going to be. Is this going to be like a, you know, a, a kids go to prom, kids get lost, kids get chased by Leatherface kind of slash movie. And um, but then I kind of sort of realised when there's stuff like you, you know, you've got that kid, so the one with the the funny hair that Eric was talking about, who's. Um, uh, uh Rennie Selvaker's date um running everyone runs down the road away from Matthew McConaughey's uh Vil- is it Vilma um the uh character uh and nobody runs off the road which it, obviously I know it's a kind of cliche in horror movies where people never you know always run away from a car chasing down the road and never actually just run off into the bushes which is what you should do um, and I thought that so it, it it for me it definitely had that kind of satire kind of feel to it. Um, I think it was kind of hit or miss um, in the second half. I think when it went completely over the top, um, I think that kind of I think it, if it had someone lesser than Matthew McConaughey playing, as in a, an actor that didn't have that complete conviction and complete going completely over the top, um, it might not have worked. But I thought it had that kind of gonzo kind of craziness that the um, the second movie kind of achieved with with some of it. Um, Renny Zellweger was a was a likable kind of heroine. Um, the uh, Lisa Marie Newmar Newmire as as Heather was um, was you know I say again it was that she was so over the top like I think Eric said the kind of Valley Girl, even though she's in from Texas uh, that persona it felt like something else was going on with this movie. Um, and by the time you get to that, the whole thing, the weird conspiracy thing, which makes no sense, really, this idea that the, um, the Sawyer clan are somehow controlled by the Illuminati and um, somebody is paying them to terrify people so much that they, trans- they, they, they achieve transcendence. But it kind of added this kind of what the fuck kind of gonzo weirdness to the thing that some of the, the other the other things, there's, you know, it's too... It's kind of weird with a slasher movie. You want you want that comfort. You want that repetitiveness. You want to hit those familiar beats uh, to some of the time. Um, but when you kind of when you've I, for me like Texas Chainsaw Massacre the original has that you know is peerless when it comes to that kind of torture. It's almost like torture, not torture porn, but torture torturing its audience. And uh, Marilyn Burns's character at the dinner table thing is one of the most intense and uncomfortable. Uh, 20 minutes you know ever put celluloid so nothing can really ever match up so again Kim Henkel seemed to be um, he was parodying it with this Um, but there's so much gonzo weirdness and so much over the top acting and so you know so much kind of elevated emotions and everything goes completely over top it's kind of quite difficult when you're watching it's such an assault on the senses of what exactly they're trying to achieve with this um uh, the whole other thing with Leatherface, I think it's kind of really interesting that um whereas the uh you know arguably I know Eric you say you love the later sequels, but they kind of they do become that cookie cutter uh Leatherface where you know Leatherface is the kind of interchangeable boogeyman of you know Freddie, Michael, Jason, whatever, which again is not a problem. But in this it's kind of interesting because I can't imagine them ever making Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees into kind of a drag queen. Um, and so this idea, which I think is really interesting, that um, Leatherface takes on the personality of the faces he wears is something that I think they were trying to get across for this. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. And also, um, a given what the, um, uh, you know, the kind of audience reaction to something like A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2 with the kind of, you know, or the mainstream audience um, or the horror reaction to a film that kind of played with homophobia and sort of um, gay kind of undertones to actually have something like this in this movie, even though it's a very low budget movie, but it was still like the fourth in the, in the franchise was quite brave and quite interesting. Um, 
that oh the the end scene with the uh, you know you were talking about the the bus and then uh, Matthew McConaughey's character being taken out by a complete random person flying a hel- um, uh, uh, airplane crop dust or whatever uh, flies and sort of chops him up. Um, it's so bizarre. And then Rennie Zellweger being taken away by this man who's presumably um, a kind of bankrolling the Sawyer clan. It's kind of stuff that you you couldn't, you know, I, it's almost like a movie that couldn't be made like this now and be released to the cinema. I couldn't imagine a movie like this being released. So it comes at a really interesting time in horror movie filmmaking, slash movie filmmaking. Like 95 probably was the nadir of, of horror movies, really. Um, arguably, because you know, after a slow decline through the late eighties and the kind of desert of the early nineties, with a lot of horror movies. I mean, not exclusively, but then the whole thing being re- reinvented, arguably with um, uh, Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson's Scream. But I think this movie has a kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting quirk. It's doing something similar, but in a different kind of way. It's satirizing those kind of later horror movies. Um, uh, kind of remaking Texas in sort of massacre, but turning into a, like another kind of gonzo horror comedy akin to um, what Toby Hooper did with the second movie. So it's not a movie that works completely, you know, I, but I actually enjoyed it um, a lot more than I thought it was, and also kind of admired it for doing something kind of kind of very different. So there you go, Nathan. Oh, thank you. Well, I'll agree it did do something different in that it completely avoided being entertaining in any way. No, it was like beyond entertaining. It transcended entertainment. I love the, at the end when you were talking about, yeah, this Matthew McConaughey's character, you know, Vilmer just gets hit in the face by flying like an airplane. And uh, like, there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, like you said, it's just a random person flying this airplane. It's not a character in the film you know, trying to take him out or anything like that. This looks like some weird accident. I uh, also love that when the guy picks her up at the end, um, like, you know, in, in most movies, what you would imagine is, you know, like he would, you know, the ending would be, you know, she's in the back of the limo with this guy and he's crazy too. And it would go off, but no, the guy literally is like, no, no need to worry. I'll take you to the hospital, which he does which I thought was very odd after everything she just saw, like, and that she had witnessed. I guess he thought nobody would believe her. It's, um, and also, of course, in that scene, there's a Marilyn Burns is there, isn't she? Yeah. And a couple of other people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The grandpa from the original, Leatherface from the original. No, not Leatherface, sorry, um, Franklin. Ah, uh, it was Franklin, was it? Okay, yeah. Because I know Gunnar Hansen was invited back to do this, and he he turned it down, didn't he? But he turned down the last, the one previous one as well, didn't he? Well, only because they wouldn't pay him. They wanted to pay him scale for it. But what do we think about? Um, because from my understanding, this movie got a, a very limited release to about twenty odd cinemas um, in 1995, and I found some reviews from back then, which are. Mentioned. And then, of course, um, as as has happened a number of times with people like Rachel Ward from um, when she uh, hit big with the Thornbirds and then they re-released uh, Night School or uh, The Final Terror with her and Daryl Hannah. Um, this is a similar thing case, wasn't it? With Matthew McConaughey and uh, Rennie Zellweger um, were both uh, just graduated, didn't they, from Texas University, I think. And, um, uh, and uh, two years later, or a year later even, they both hit the big time uh, with Jerry Maguire and whatever it was that uh, Matthew McConaughey hit on the big time. And it got um, re-released to cinemas where after they were both famous, but again to quite a small release, which I think accounts for the reason why there's two different titles for the movie. Um, but then I think it got a, it got a saturation video release uh, to sort of try and play up their involvement. But from what I've read, um, they're not... Uh, they're they're kind of uh, they're not um, neither of them are sort of uh, certainly Rennie Zellweger has kind of hasn't sort of uh, distanced herself from the movie has she? But uh, yeah, so I I know Rennie Zellweger said she had I've said she had no shame about being in this movie, which is kind of uh, refreshing, isn't it? I guess you know they actually got lucky um, in that Renee Zellweger and Matthew McConaughey like are two of the main characters in the movie, so they can 
kind of slap their names on the cover and it's not really a, a lie or a, a misdirect. I remember the days of going to see uh, the video store and I would see Alice Sweet Alice and they would have Brooke Shields name like, I mean, her role is important in the film, but she's hardly the main character. Well, exactly. I mean, with this one, they are, they are the leads, aren't they? Yeah, I know that some people say if they put Shadows Run Black starring Kevin Costner, uh, people mm-hmm. might be disappointed if they went and watched it. So, so do you have any other backgrounds? Let's see. Um, uh, well, we talked about some of the background that I had, uh, but um, let's see what else I got here. Uh, they also asked uh, Jim Sido or Sido. Um, hope I'm not mispronouncing that. Um, if he wanted to return, but, um, you know, he turned it down. I imagine, you know, probably at that point in time, you know, it, it was probably a matter of, you know, I can't do all that physical stuff, um, uh, probably required for the role. Um, and as we said, yeah, uh, Sally, um, um, uh, or Marilyn Burns is on the gurney at the end, uh, which has always been a weird scene to me because, I mean, it's, you know, Sally from the original, but it, the way it's played, I mean, you would never have known unless, you know, like you literally looked it up. Because I remember the first time I watched it back in 95 when that scene happened, I kept thinking, who is that supposed to be? Because she looked at her like she knew her. But you know what it was? This is artistic, you guys. She knew her because they experienced the similar horrors. When I read that uh, she was... Uh, had a cameo at the end, I was like, ooh, is this all meant to take place in 1974 as well? But then I realised there's a title card at the start of the film that says, no, it's definitely um, May or something of 1994. So, Well, that has to be the worst hospital ever if she's still there after 20-odd years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? Talk about waiting times. Yeah. Mm. Bill Johnson, who played Leatherface in Texas Chainsaw 2, was offered the role of Leatherface, but it didn't really pan out, so... You know, when they um, they went with Robert Jacks, who, according to uh, Renee Zellweger, was actually super excited um, about taking the role of Leatherface, which I can understand because, you know, it's an iconic character. So definitely uh, worth it. Um, well, let's see. I think that's all that I got because, yeah, everything else I'm seeing, we've already talked about. Well, thank you, Nathan. What about you, Eric? Uh, I have got nothing else to add apart from uh, we did a Fango flashback uh, earlier this year or maybe it was last year where it did the, a really unusual thing for Fango where they, they had an article on the making of this film which it was at then was was called The Return of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre but they also had a two page review of the film which they never used to do um, but the review is scathing it ends with the words uh, it's how bad the film is and how unwatchable it truly is they say so they weren't fans even though that they were, were plugging the making of um, in the same issue so yeah uh, I would be on board with that review, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Well, what about you, Joseph? Do you have anything else to add? No. No? Okay. Well, I've just got a couple of little bits here from the, the reviews um, that I found uh, from its original release in 95. Um, so a couple of paragraphs. The Colombian said, The new movie gets back to the weird, campy attitude of the original. An independently financed film made on a shoestring budget. Uh, and they said the film had wild energy. Um, the uh, the Atlanta Journal said it was a nice mix of horror and satire. It's a real cut up. Uh, and uh, in an interview from the the same issue of the Columbian, Kim Henkel said uh, the film was a black comedy about dysfunction. Uh, and he said he purposely decided not to have too much gore in the movie, which I think you can you alluded to, Eric, didn't you? When you said like no one's killed with a chainsaw in this movie. Yeah, Joseph, I think, said that, yeah. Yeah, there's very little gore at all in this. So I think it's probably the, the least bloody. Although, of course, the original didn't really have much in the way of gore, did it? There's barely any in, in three, either. Yeah, but the only time you really see... I mean, the, the 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 most blood you see is when Leatherface cuts his leg at the end of the movie, when he drops a chainsaw on it, if I remember correctly. But, uh, so, um, okay, well, Nathan, are you surprised at our reactions? Uh, yes and no. Um, I'm, I mean, I expected Eric's reaction because, you know, it, I've known how he's felt about the series, you know, <laughs> we've covered three already. So I wasn't expecting him to enjoy it. 
Um, Joseph, I'm not too surprised because I feel like he's seen it before and I kind of knew he wasn't a fan. Um, your reaction, Justin, um, pleasantly surprised. I kind of thought you'd be a little bit more scathing to it. Okay, well, they'd like to keep you on your toes. But let's see, um, what was the consensus on the Facebook group, Joseph? Well, we got 44 comments for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre of the Next Generation. That's pretty impressive. Uh, Jared Gravoya says, I love everything about this film. The characters, the misdirection, the 90s rock music, the over-the-top performances, the double VHS cover art. It is one of the best slasher sequels ever. Eric, you would agree with that, wouldn't you? <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> well, there's here's one that Eric would agree with. Miles Hamer writes, A bellowing, ugly cacophony of a movie that's ugly and misjudged on every conceivable level. Not even a single chainsaw death in this miserable, wretched mess that has the temerity to end on some barely thought out conspiracy bullshit. I hate every atom of this fucking thing. Wow. Wow. Couldn't Hard. be more wow. polarized, really. That's yeah. A, yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date on all that we're doing. Listen on Amazon, Apple, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, and about a billion other podcatchers, both good and terrible. Join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per month to help support the show, or if you're financially inclined to do so, select one of those tiers that fits your budget for that extra monthly bonus content. That's patreon.com forward slash the hysteria continues, all one word, and that goes for our email address as well, the hysteria continues at gmail.com. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, and thank you for everyone who has uh, signed up to Patreon, and we uh, hope you enjoyed um, the Halloween 2 commentary we've just released. So presumably that, well, that would be out by now, wouldn't it? I take that as a yes. So. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> yes, it has been released. Okay, excellent. Um, and, um, well, I know we have a little bit of feedback to come up, but let's see if uh, Eric's Joke of the Week gives us a little buzz or not. It's my Joke of the Week. It's so, so What do you call it when the chainsaw-wielding villain runs after the ditzy character in Texas Chainsaw Massacre The Next Generation? You call it the Leatherface Heather Chase. Because <laughs> her name's Heather. And Heather Chase and Leatherface can rhyme. And so... That's the joke. <laughs> I thought the joke was actually mildly amusing, but I think Eric's sweet tears are even funnier. Yeah, that was funny. So cruel. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well done, Eric. Yes, thank you. There's your fucking daily bread. Eat it like you did those horse cunts before you became a priest. <laughs> so we have some feedback, don't we? Who would like to go first? I can go first. Okay. All right. This says, have any of you fine persons seen the conference? It's a genuinely good Swedish slasher film that owes a bit to severance and a surprising amount to the Friday the 13th franchise. A mass killer is picking off office worker types at a sort of cabin site. I liked it more than time travel slasher totally killer, which is also pretty good. I enjoyed dark harvest too, but that one is a bit more hit and miss. I'm looking forward to Eli Roth's Thanksgiving. As for trick or treats, not really a slasher. Decent cast, not bad looking, somewhat dull. I actually quite like it. I think this is because I first watched it when I was very, very drunk and had achieved a Zen state of inebriation. The director, Gary Graver, had a surprisingly respectable career as a cinematographer. He worked with Orson Welles and John Cassavetes. Um, as a director, you may remember him for, for such films as Bikini Traffic School. And that was from Daniel. I've not seen Bikini Traffic School, but I would watch it. Mm. We have seen um, Moon, Moon Over Scorpio, or whatever it was called. Moon in Scorpio. Yes. Yeah, whatever. We did well, a commentary we, for it. We did a commentary for it, didn't we? And we actually yes, talked so. about the conference in our recently seen. I'm kind of, I, I've mixed feelings about the Thanksgiving 
Um, partly, well, purely really to do with Eli Roth, really, because I don't hate his movie. Some of them I, I'm not a great fan of, um, but uh, some of them I haven't minded. But he tends to go for that kind of slightly more cynical, kind of extreme feel to it. So how that kind of transfers to like an 80s style slasher movie, like a tribute to 80s, early 80s slasher movies, I don't know. Um, it, it's, kind not, of like, it's not. It, it's not based on the trailer in in no in Grindhouse. It's inspired by it, but not not. Uh, it's not a remake of it in the same way that Machete, was, you know, was made from the trailer. And I have a feeling. I have a feeling more's the pity because I I I wanted a movie based. I mean, that duplicated that trailer, and I Me don't too. think that's what we're going to yeah. get. Mm. But I've been waiting for this movie for so long that I'm. I'm trying to taper my expectations, but at the same time, I'm really excited for it. So it's just a wait and see thing. I kind of, for me, I'd, I'm, I'd like to be proved wrong. And I, I, to be honest, I quite enjoy the Terrifier movies for what they are. But I kind of feel that that's kind of seems to be the kind of bellwether for horror movies at the moment with filmmakers. So it's kind of, for me, it feels like it may be like a mean spirited kind of take on that kind of extreme horror that you see in something like Terrifier. Um, I'd like to be proved wrong, or if it's, or at least if it's done well, then that would be something. But uh, yeah, I kind of part, part of me was hoping that it'll be slightly kind of cheesy, fun, early '80s slasher sort of um, pastiche. Um, but given it's Eli Roth, I kind of think he's playing to his own audience. So I let's let's wait and see. I kind of guess. Well, uh, thank you for writing in, and uh, we have another one. I think, Eric. Yes, uh, this is from Alyssa, Alyssa Kaloya, and she says, Hello again. Thank you for reading out my feedback on your Psycho 3 episode. I just wanted to include a couple of tidbits about the Psycho series after the third movie. First, Psycho 4 was a made-for-TV movie airing on Showtime in November 1990 before its VHS release. While I like the scenes with Norman's past with Henry Thomas and Olivia Hussey, the wraparound seg- segments uh, just don't work for me. I should note that Psycho 4 ignores Psycho 2 and 3, so Mick Garris was rebooting sequels eight years before Halloween H2O. Second, there was another made-for-TV movie, Bates Motel, that aired in 1987. Obviously, it's not related to the A&E TV series, as it has Bud Court inheriting the motel from a deceased Norman Bates. I haven't watched it yet, but Universal did release it on DVD a few years ago, so I may have just I so I may have just ordered it. Uh, anyway, thanks again for another great episode, and that's from Alyssa Kaloya. I do remember that um, Bates Motel from 1987, and I'm pretty sure I have watched it, but I can't remember anything about it. Um, it was originally intended to be a pilot for yes, a TV series, yeah. I think. I think that's true as well, yeah. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen Psycho 4 in a while. I do remember thinking it was okay, though. So Yeah, because I'm kind of... Uh, the Bates Motel with Bud Court, I was interested, because I mean, Harold and Maud is kind of one of my favourite movies um, of all time, so I'd be interested to see... Oh, kind really? Of, Mine too? Yeah, yeah, I sort of really enjoy that movie, but I think we should pick that up for an, an off-piece at some point, shouldn't we? It's almost a horror movie, but a very sort of black comedy. Um, so, uh, and Psycho 4, I kind of don't remember the wraparound, but I do remember Henry Thomas and Olivia Hussey in in the movie. So, yeah, but it'd be interesting for us to pick it, which I'm sure won't be too far off in the future, I guess. But, uh, you know, in, interesting insights, Alyssa, so thank you again for writing in. And that's it. That's it. So is there anything else that we need to, or not need to discuss? I was going to mention, if you haven't picked up our uh, vinegar, vinegar, syndro- the vinegar Syndrome, I've just put out Rabid Grannies, which of course is another one of Nathan's favourites, on uh, a very snazzy Blu-ray uh, edition with a fantastic lenticular cover. Um, and we did a commentary for that, which was a lot of fun. So uh, yeah, no, if you do get a chance to pick that up, we've got a couple of more commentaries in the wings, haven't we? Yeah, one's for a movie we've already done a commentary for. But I'm not going to say what it is, but uh, it's it's a second commentary and it's worth it. Yes, yeah. So that, and also there's another one for a newer movie, which I don't think has been announced yet. But yeah, so keep your eyes out for that. But uh, I guess um, I, it's my choice next time, isn't it? So, well, I did um, on Hysteria Lives, I did manage 31 reviews for Halloween. Amazingly, that's what comes from lying on a sofa with a damaged foot. So um, so I kind of got a bit more into my 90s groove 
uh, when it comes to slashers. So I thought it was one that was reviewed on History Lives many years ago. And I haven't seen it since way, way back in the day. And I used to have the VHS of it. Uh, so I thought maybe going not exactly sight unseen. Uh, it's a clown at midnight uh, from 1998 or 97. I think it's 98. Um, a Canadian. 99. Produ- 99, sorry, is it? Okay. Uh, I think it's a Canadian uh, production. So I can remember quite liking it, but um, it remains to be seen. But I think it'd be quite interesting also for maybe us for us to have a chat about some other of those kind of post scream slashes uh, outside of the big boys of I know what we did last summer and Urban Legends and Valentine, some of the others that uh, you know slip between the cracks, as it were. So uh, yeah, so that's my uh, my choice for next time. And Nathan, what are we playing out with? Um, we are playing out with We Are Family by Sister Sledge. Okay. A nice little up-tempo disco number to finish the Texas Chains Massacre TNG. <laughs> so, fantastic. Okay. Well, uh, thank you for listening. And we will catch you next time for some more clown action. Um, uh, so, say goodbye to the good people. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.